Growing up in the South Bronx, when the heroin epidemic really hit strong, I got used to seeing the addicts, the men nodding on the corners. And so I grew up with that sense. We just didn't drop out of the sky addicted to heroin. We became addicted to heroin because of the situation and our environment exposed us to heroin. You could buy a bag of heroin for $3. So people got addicted to heroin, and then it, it just got out of control. At one point, there were 100,000 addicts in New York. So I wanted to do something. go into the Panther Party came as I watched and observed the interaction of people, the interaction of party, and what the police was doing at the time. Even if the situation required verbal interaction, verbal communication, they rather use the baton and use force. This I seen. I didn't have to read in this in the evening paper. I seen this. So I offered my skills in the martial arts to the Panther Party. Located in the Bronx chapter on Boston Road. In the community, we structured the free lunch program. to the daycare center. The name of this revolutionary puppet show is called The Child, The Man, The Revolutionary, The Panther. the United States, we came to learn how to misspell our name, to lose the definition of pride, to have misfortune on our side, to live where rats and roaches roam, to be trained to turn on television sets, to dream about jobs you will never get, to fill out welfare applications, to graduate from school without an education, to be drafted, distorted, and destroyed, to work full time and still be- After work at Lincoln Hospital, I would sell my newspapers, my Black Panther Party newspapers. I sold the newspapers across the street from the hospital because that's the closest place and there were lots of people. There was a, a lot of people walking back and forth. And on the stoop every day was this 15 year old and his buddy who was about 25 maybe and they were stomp down heroin addicts. And I kept telling them, you know, you don't want to be addicted to heroin. And let me show you why. Because the system is keeping you, I gave them the whole spiel. System is keeping you down by making sure that you stay addicted and you don't stand up and fight against all the exploitation and, and horrible conditions that we live in because you're over here nodding. Out. You don't want to fight when you're on heroin. You don't want to. You just stay there and nod yourself into oblivion. During that era, I found out I was very political. I don't know how this happened. Obviously, subconsciously, something was working in me. I was admiring the Panthers. I had already met with Bobby Seale. 
and James Foreman and had told Bobby Seale, I wanted to make a counterpart. I wanted to organize the counterpart to the Black Panthers called the Brown Tigers. He said, son, can I tell you something? We're catching hell being called the Black, uh, the Black Panthers. I would suggest that you find another name and work the objective conditions of your country. Try to, try to apply socialism to the objective conditions of your country. And don't try to do what we do. I thought that was a brilliant answer. Another panelist, Mr. Philippe Luciano, a member of the Young Lords, and I've asked him to speak briefly as to the philosophy of his organization and what he feels its place in the community is. Mr. Luciano. Well, first of all, the Young Lords are a predominantly Puerto Rican group operating out of East Harlem. Basically, the way we go about mobilizing our people is through serving their needs. That is, if our people need hot water, then we're going to get hot water. If it's shoes on their feet, then we're going to give them shoes. Right? And if it's a political campaign that needs, that needs to be run, then we're going to run political campaigns. That's basically what the Young Lords are about. Um, in the process of bringing... And I just fell in love with the, the movement. He, I, once I heard him speak about what we had to do in our community, I wanted to join the movement. Have you seen the skinny little boy that chases the white ghost at night? Have you seen, Have you seen the little boy? Face puffed up, tracks in his arm, and his mind blown. His mom is somewhere drinking and talking about survival. Pops in jail or downtown in the wild. The little boy chases white ghosts with his friend, and they get high. And they get high. And they get high. And they get high. Like cloud nine, where everything is fine. The fast rise of people's personal economy grew as a result of selling drugs. Qualitatively, that overshadowed living harmoniously amongst each other, which the Panther Party was introducing. So we had to tackle the drugs now. They are not just as at first, we went to those who were distributing the drugs and selling drugs. We asked that they stop. They wouldn't. Then we just kindly removed them out of the community. It didn't hit the low middle class or middle class neighborhoods. It was in. It was clearly in in the in the areas of color. If it isn't large enough to to get to the influential community, if it isn't a big media story, if it doesn't affect your kid going to school every day because you're in Forest Hills or you're in Bay Ridge or you're in some middle class neighborhood, it's not a big problem. I was with, uh, as an administrative assistant to John Lindsay when he was mayor from 1966 to 1973, and basically my responsibility was the street. The blue uniforms that run to the streets like stormtroopers, they are here to protect white law. They are to have an uh, armed camp attitude for black men. As long as that situation is real, we can't have a very good relationship with them. I see another point, too, uh, dealing with the pigs and police. The pigs is the one who bring heroin in our community. You see, if it wasn't for the pigs, heroin wouldn't be saturated through the black community. What they do, uh, when the police make a, a big uh, narcotic raid and he get like uh, a kilo of heroin, he would turn in a pound of it, and then he put the other pound that's left back in the community, and that's somebody selling for him. And he's selling heroin for the police. Uh, that's why when we confiscated the heroin last Friday, Somebody from the Post and other news media said that uh, we should have took that uh, kilo of heroin and gave it to the police. We would have gave it to the police at 3 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, we would have been back in Harlem. Pass to the people, brother. Pass brother.
our self-defense, uh, not because we, we, um, uh, we like violence, no one likes violence, but that you have to like make a differentiation between the, the open and direct violence uh, that, um, that very often is attributed to revolutionaries and the type of violence that happens every day on a regular basis among poor people, uh, whether it's the violence of having to go all winter in an apartment that has no heat, or whether it's the violence of having to go to a hospital uh, that doesn't give you service and you end up dying anyway. You don't die with a bullet necessarily, uh, but you die in, in other ways. And that type of violence takes a lot more lives. Today, we don't want to just have Robbie here. We're going to go marching to the streets of South Bronx. We're going to tell the people of South Bronx that we're not going anywhere, that we're going to be here until this hospital is and it's put back in the hands of the people. That building was condemned 25 years ago. Condemned because it was unsafe for human habitation. Condemned for rich people and opened up for poor people. That's what always happens. Young Lords, Black Panthers, workers and patients who set up a complaint table. So we took complaints to rat bites for babies, lead poisoning, uh, asthma, heroin addiction. They have those 2,000 complaints that we got from the patient work complaint table in their hands and have done nothing about them. A group called the Health Revolutionary Unity Movement, some blacks, some Puerto Ricans, some Jewish Americans, we all got together essentially when we decided it's time to do something. And we decided, I know this is gonna sound crazy, we decided to take over the hospital. It was an occupation that came straight out of the Normandy invasion. Understand, it, it's a U-Haul truck driven by a friend of ours. The gate rolls up, and we were sitting with our legs, our legs open, and there were people, like the guy would sit between us, and we, I mean, it was like a paratroop assault. I knew that we were ready because I was expecting them to look at me for confirmation. Not one person looked at me. They knew exactly what their roles were. We took the built physical plan, it was 11 stories high, we took it in seven and a half minutes. We secured it in 15. That morning, the Puerto Rican flag is flying over Lincoln Hospital. The cops come. They had more cops than I had ever seen in my life. So they send over their best negotiators, a guy named Al, Sid Davidoff and Barry Goddard. So I get a call one morning that um, the young lords have taken over the hospital, whatever that means, taken over the hospital. The police are ready to move in. Uh, they've got hostages. Uh, can we do something about it? It's one thing to have a demonstration in the street and you cordon it off and you have police and you do what you have to do. This is a hospital where people come who are seriously injured or seriously sick, and we couldn't provide, it couldn't provide patient care. And that, it was not, we had to draw the line there. Don't let anybody tell you that there was one minute of disruption of, of the delivery of health care at Lincoln Hospital when the young lords took it over. Never. We uh, had our press conference where we said the hospital had been taken over and we were willing to negotiate, but these were the demands. Pretty much those demands were the thousands of complaints that we had received uh, from the patients in the emergency room at our complaint table. We kept our end of the bargain. Uh, we did open a, t a detox center soon thereafter with, as I remember, a Puerto Rican administrator, uh, I'm pretty sure. And that was the beginning of the Lincoln Detox Center.
we have now started the Lincoln Hospital Drug Detoxification Program. We brought hundreds of uh, drug addicts, heroin addicts, came. The first day that we opened up the doors, there were 200. Walter came in off the street. And I was in nursing school walking up the block with my ex-wife, and I saw this big Puerto Rican flag across the street where the barber was. So when I told him I was in nursing school, he says, why don't you volunteer? In the beginning, I was just like a translator, because all the doctors were white and didn't speak Spanish. And since I had a little experience with nursing school, I went from being a translator to uh, drawing blood. And the clients loved me, because they said I had a, excellent hands. They even said, you know, I wish I would have known you or you would have been my shooting partner. This is my, uh, this is one of my cards. Does that have my name on it? We used to be at the entranceway, and we had a big box at the entranceway. When, when the addicts used to come in, we used to say to them, uh, put your weapons here. Or when you leave, you'll get them back. And of course, this is what they used to do. So they had uh, zip guns. They had uh, knives that were called uh, 007s. Uh, they have uh, 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 ice picks. They, had, they carried all this stuff because when they were out there in the street, you never know when you were going to get mugged or you actually were going to do the mugging, right? Your eyes are brown, your hair's brown, your head is 5'6", you said? Yeah. OK, you haven't had a physical blood test? You're not a handicap? All right, now listen. I'm going to put my name on your car. That's my home number, all right? And if you have any problem where you can't get in here, you call me up, all right? And then once we had doctors from Lincoln Hospital who said that they were going to be responsible, that's when we brought Matulu in. Okay, because we had a medical, you know, a medical director, and we wanted to have a director that had revolutionary consciousness. I was just a sister that came to the clinic, was really messed up. You know, I didn't know anything. I was not politically conscious of anything. I was just troubled. I've learned a lot of things as I've been there in terms of helping your people, making it better for your people. You know, I learned about the, the, the streets and the drugs to that nature, you know, and what it was doing to our people. That's why the political classes, the political education classes, we used to call them PE classes, were so important because we gave them history. We gave them history about what happened in Africa what happened in China, what happened in Puerto Rico, the political movements that were stopped because of the drugs. We start realizing a lot more of who we was, thinking about our African roots, realizing that the names that our parents carried were the names of slave masters that our forefathers had. And that's what we used to call them. What's your, what was your slave name? You know? And most of us that changed our name wanted to get rid of those slave names. And we wanted names that more accurately portrayed who and what we were. You figure, yeah, you've been oppressed all your life, right? So then you wonder where that is coming from, right? But they forget to tell you, right, that the problem really comes from the system. Because who oppresses your mother? Who oppresses your father, right? The system. The system oppresses your father, so therefore they oppress you, you know? And when they start oppressing you, like you hanging out in the streets, right? And the, uh, the, only, the only solution that you have... I don't know if you've ever seen a, um, a drug addict detox, but it is horrible. They have chills, they're sick, they, they're cold sometimes, they're hot sometimes. It is really, really, it's a horrible... I, that's why people don't want to get off of drugs, because it's such a, a horrible experience, you know, the, the, the actual body detoxing. My poem was Jones coming down. 
You know, day breaks, got the shakes, nose running, joint dripping, mind slipping, body aches. Jones coming down. My time is pitch riding a white horse into my main vein. Damn, baby, I got to kill this man. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. If you are a heroin addict, you need upwards of $100 a day to buy heroin to feed your addiction. And you will literally do anything to get some heroin to relieve the withdrawal. Nixon was under a lot of pressure um, to show real evidence that he was cutting down on black street crime. And you get those people into a program where they are getting methadone every day, they have no withdrawal symptoms and they have no need to go out and steal or hold somebody up at, at gunpoint. So there's a direct correlation. The more people on methadone, the lower the crime rate. It's then possible to get access to the person on a regular basis. The very fact that it's addicting is one of its real attributes. Once a person is on methadone, he has to come back every day. Methadone itself in 1970 is not a new drug. What was novel was its use as a maintenance drug, meaning that someone who used to use heroin several times a day indefinitely could use methadone once a day indefinitely. They would be maintained on it, not detoxified with it. If you're coming from a place that is very critical of federal, state, and local government and how it treats black people, brown people, poor people, Asian people, you understandably might come to regard methadone maintenance with some suspicion because it is regulated and in large part dispensed by the government. And we came here and we went to fight for the United States. If we can fight for them, why can't they fight for us Vietnam veterans? I got hooked in Vietnam, you know, with, with drugs. So then after I came from over there, you know, I couldn't get any jobs over here. So I went to the welfare center and they told me, you have to get into a, a methadone on program. And if you, if you don't get into a methadone on program, you won't be able to get help. What's oh. methadone doing for you? Is it helping you? Getting me high, getting me high, that's all. That's all. What they saw was that was just replacing one addiction with another. And what they wanted to do at Lincoln Detox is have a chemical-free way of detoxing heroin, and also a methadone for that matter. By 72, we started looking around for an alternative. We no longer wanted to use methadone. Dr. Matula Shakur, if it wasn't for his leadership, I don't think we ever would have done what we did. And he was the one who found this article in the newspaper. That an acupuncturist who was treating someone with respiratory problems, who also happened to be addicted to opium, had found that by uh, stimulating the lung point of the ear, did not only help the respiratory problem, but also took away the withdrawal symptoms of opium. 
So there were six of us there, and we each would read a paragraph. And when we read that article, everybody sort of, the light was turned on, and we said, wait, why don't we do this? When I walked into the program, I was 17 and a half years old, or 18. And I walked into the program and I saw this old man with needles in him. And I said, these people are really crazy in here. They sticking needles in folk and that kind of thing. I need to get up out of here. But I stayed because I wanted to get off of the drugs. So that was the first time I saw acupuncture. I stayed in the treatment program. And as I stayed in the treatment program, I began to politicize myself. I began to educate myself and study, uh, you know, about movement stuff and politics and philosophies, etc. Shortly thereafter that, I began to study acupuncture under Dr. Matulu Shakur. When the uh, uh, patients or victims would come up, we would say, well, listen, we're not going to give you no methadone today, but what we're going to do is massage your feet, we massage your back, and we massage your ears. And what we would use, we're going to use our finger. And so, before we even got needles, we care. A whole lot of other films with Dr. Matula, and or Google Dr. Matula. Go to Facebook, not Facebook. What's the other book? YouTube, and um, you can get the information. There is so many documented pieces on it. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to bring up the panel now. And our um, brother, oh, who's going to put the chairs up? OK, I need four chairs. Four oh, chairs, OK. All right, that's brother bigger. So um, like I said, the rest of the um, documentation is there. Again, brother Kakai is giving away for a donation acupuncture treatment. And uh, he's good at what he do. And um, he also have other herbs. Me, myself, um, he came to town. I'm just talking while he bringing the chairs up. And uh, um, he came to town. I wasn't feeling real good. I was at the Locks Conference. And myself, Sister Cheryl, and another sister met with him. And he was at, oh, you know what? We didn't play Brother Sabukwe. Where is? Dr. Ahmed. Yeah. And also, we got to put him in. Dr. Ahmed, for those of you who don't know who Dr. Ahmed is, is very important. And you know, um, some people know Ms. Max Stanford. And you know, we know Ms. Dr. Ahmed. No. He's sick as well, too. But a brother brought a, um, um, he videoed a piece so that people could, so he can express his feelings about Dr. Um, Dr. Matua and what he meant to him. And Dr. Matua, on his last speaking engagement, spoke very highly of Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed is from Philadelphia. And um, RAM organization, if you don't know anything about RAM, look it up. It's Revolutionary Action Movement. I'm quite sure y'all probably talk about him, you know, as well. But, again, we're going to bring the panel up. Brother Rasakhan Shahid is going to take over now from Nation Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey family, uh, I generally say that before I say anything, it just means I seek refuge in Allah from Satan the curse, but in my heart and mind I say, I seek refuge in the creator from the madness that we are forced to live in. And this is a mad world, you know what I mean? They try to make sane people think they mad, and that's, it really throws things off. Uh, I'm with Nation Time Judicial Research, and what we do is uh, legal research for incarcerated individuals across the nation. 
what we do is train, well, we got paralegals in almost every institution, uh, well, quite a few institutions. You know, like we about 400 strong, and each one teach one, and that's what we be doing. But now I'm not associating with groups, organizations. We don't get no money because they asked me to change my mission statement. I want to read it for you. Uh, a nation time judicial research mission statement is to reverse the unjust, illegal, discriminatory way America's apartheid judicial system is applied. We will seek the exoneration and the restoration to society of persons who have been wrongly convicted. We will pursue the arrest and conviction and or punishment of judges, prosecutors, police who knowingly hide, lie, falsify, or manufacture evidence uh, false evidence which uh, results in an innocent person going to jail, especially those sent to death row. We will submit to our uh, subscribers legal, local, and, and worldwide information normally unavailable to indigent incarcerated persons because we are primarily all certified paralegals. Our duties are to first do legal research for incarcerated indigent individuals all indigent persons trying to get back into court. If we see through our research they have been illegally convicted, we will raise funds to hire lawyers to represent them. Nation Time has a mailing list of 400 incarcerated persons. Our goal is to provide educational, judicial, political, current affairs, any and all material that would be helpful for individuals returning to court, returning to society. And the reason why they uh, oppose this because they will tell us we can't send judges to jail. We can't send police to jail. And the only reason why uh, they say that is because they do not follow the law. You know, what we follow is the Constitution. And the Constitution says no one is above the law. That means Clarence Thomas. That means uh, uh, Trump. All of them. And, you know, and they... they it's, it's so ridiculous. I mean, I used to, I'm a news junkie. I used to love it. I can't stand watching them jokers no more. Cause they, they're not lying. They just don't say nothing. You know, the people is lying all around them and they won't say nothing. Here's, a, here's a, here's a, a prime example. Here's Trump. He goes to Russia somewhere with Putin in front of the whole world. He commits treason. He tell, uh, met the, uh, the, the FBI, the CIA, and national intelligence is telling them, uh, we got evidence that Putin did this, Putin did that. Trump said on international television, oh, uh, well, Putin didn't say he did that. So I believe him rather than y'all. That is treason. Here he go, take Putin in a private office, him and a secretary, him and a, 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 a subscriber, and says, nobody can come in here but me and Putin, and tell the woman that don't tell nobody what we talked about. I mean, are you kidding me? And then they're going to run around and get, we were supposed to get excited because they trying to find out who he done paid to screw. God damn, we getting ready to die. They say, well, he can't go, he can't win election like that. He don't want to win. He wants civil war. Cause this is what it's all, this is what it's all about. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, that, uh, uh, his sec treasury secretary, Betsy DeVos, the dumbest broad that ever lived, made her the head of education. But you know why he did that? Her brother is named Eric Prince. He's a Navy SEAL, and he owns Blackwater. Blackwater is that revolutionary group that they outsource the, the war to. You know what I'm saying? All they want is something. I mean, they want to make it look like, I mean, the Democrats are such cowards. I wanted to call them something else, but that's too good for them. You know what I mean? They such cowards. And then they want you to respect them. But our thing has been, we stand down. For 28 years, I was incarcerated. All I studied was law and religion. And it seemed like both of them kind of like failed me. You know what I'm saying? So I had to get into, like they say, get in where you fit in. You know what I mean? I follow individuals. That's why I was stuck on... Uh, 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 Iman Alameen, 
Mumi Abu Jamal. I followed the Black Panthers. I followed the Black Liberation Army. I followed their work. We, we you know, I, we was on the outside looking in. And this brother here, Iman Lukman Abdullah, he had 35 young groups across the nation that they would, uh, I should have kept my cane with me. <laughs> I mean, you know, it fell off my face. <laughs> yeah. He had 35 youth groups that they were, uh, out of, uh, out of Detroit. He had a warehouse and they would collect clothes, food, uh, building materials, all that old kind of stuff. They would teach these young kids. I mean, all of them were street dudes, hustlers and all that old kind of stuff. They would teach them how to. I was born in the Congo. I walked. What did that mean? Shut up. Oh. Yeah, uh, he was showing them how to uh, 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 rebuild their whole communities. You know what I'm saying? The the government assassinated them. But do you know who they used to assassinate him? A Muslim imam from Saudi Arabia. You know what I'm saying? I'm a Muslim. And I would ask any Muslims anywhere, where in Islam is anything called a royal family? You won't find it. They hypocrites. You know what I mean? But... To say that, uh, uh, well, they told me I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get killed any goddamn way. That's what I want. The prophets say, if you believe what you say, pray for death. All I want to do is down the front line. Don't let me weaken. Don't let me uh, surrender no time. And that's it. Get off of Baba Rise again. He ain't playing. Because you heard what he said. What'd that mean? What'd that mean? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, uh, Brother Shirak, Sh Shamari. Oh, he's in the back. Okay. I'm supposed, to I'm supposed to introduce the brother. He is a magnificent brother. He tried to put me on the radio, but I get so excited sometimes. I might say anything, and we all get thrown off that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here you go, brother. <laughs> Greetings. Good evening, everybody. Seriously. Um, so what I would like to do, because I don't have the paper in front of me, I'm going to ask if you know you're supposed to be on this panel. I'm going to ask you to come up front so we can get started and we can jump right in. And then I'm going to have you introduce yourself. The brother right there, Brother Dre, has microphones. There's an entrance on this side or up the front. Um, and I'm looking for Dre so I can get these microphones in everybody's hands so we can get started. I can stand up. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> How's everybody doing out there? I can't really see y'all, but I believe it's good. So t if you want to, you can take this time. Feel free. We had the donation bucket. If you haven't had a chance to support uh, the cause by dropping in a love offering, a donation, whatever it is you want to call it, feel free to do so. We'll probably be ready in about the next three to five minutes, it looks like. Yeah, yes, sir. If that's cool. Your light is just All right, we got everybody. Oh, oh, that's, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All 
How many of y'all had a chance to hear the interview with the brother Kakai earlier today? Any, anybody listen to that? All right, cool. Yeah, I'm trying to see if he's here. I can't, I really can't. I, I wanted to meet the brother before I jumped up here, but I can't really see. Oh, okay. All right. I, I see somebody moving. Just wanted to say hi. Greetings, brother. It was a pleasure talking to you earlier today. Much thanks. Glad to see you made it down. <laughs> without a doubt. Without a doubt. I need it. So I'm looking for the sign. Are we started? Should I go? Oh, okay. All right. Let's go. All right, coach. <laughs> so greetings. Um, I'm Eric Keith Grimes, Brother Shamari. I have the privilege and the honor of uh, moderating a panel. I'm going to try to get out of the way um, as much as possible. I'm going to ask each of you to take a minute to introduce yourself and let people know who you are and why you're here with us today. So because that's a big question, I'll give you 90 seconds. I'll start at the end with Brother Jandai and work our way down. My name, my name is John Harrell. And I'm here today because I had the honor and the pleasure of being with Dr. Matul Shakur for 12 years in three different federal institutions. I first met him in USP Lewisburg, and then I got transferred to USP Atlanta for leading the work strike. And several months later, he came down there, and we were there for many, many years. And we formed what we call a circle of consciousness where any brother in the prison who wanted to change his life, who wanted to educate himself, and most importantly, prepare himself to go back out in, into our community and to build community and to atone for the things that we had done in our past. Uh, I left Doc in uh, 2007. He was, was transferred to ADX, and I went home in 2009, and all of the work that I've been blessed to do here in the city of Philadelphia and across the country, I lay at the feet of Doc. Right. He was a mentor, a friend, a comrade, one of the most incredible human beings you will ever meet, and I hope to convey a little bit of that to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mic check. Can everybody hear me? All power to the people and free the land. What's the call? The gross is dead. What's the call? Freedom. What's the call? Freedom. What's the call? Freedom. I'm here because Raza Khan told me to come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brother Zaid Muhammad. I'm looking forward to meeting Dr. Matulu Shakur. Uh, in the mid 1980s, around the time I was just beginning to do work around political prisoners. Matulu was just going into captivity. I was in my 20s then. I'm in my 60s now. We need to thank the God of our ancestors and everybody else who will punch a cracker in the face to the umpteenth that Matulu Shakur is home. I'm the organ, uh, lead organizer and, and founding press officer for the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee in New York City, and I'm an old street cat from up south in Newark, New Jersey. <coughs> greetings. Um, greetings and good afternoon, or is it evening? I don't know. It's after five, right? It's evening. So I'm honored to be here. Um, I was also invited uh, to be here by Sister, Sister Pam and Brother Razakhan. My name is Dequi Keone Siddiqui, and I am here because I am a freedom-loving, new African Cherokee Shinnecock black woman. And I work on with and on behalf of U.S. held political prisoners and prisoners of war, particularly those long-held, decades-long-held Black Panther and Black Liberation army political prisoners and some of the white anti-imperialist political prisoners that have been in prison for decades. So I am an organizer, an educator, and political prisoners, their, 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 their lives are not just history. These are my family members, right? They, they are family. We break bread even though it's on the inside of the wall. Um, they call our house. We write. 
uh, Brother Mogadishu made sure when, oh, I'm all, also married to this man here, Sekou Odinga, right? So. <laughs> most important, that's most important. So, <laughs> so when Sekou was inside, and I won't give away his bio, but that brother right there, Mogadishu, made sure that I got to see him as much as I could. And not only to see Sekou, but to go visit other political prisoners. So that's why I'm here, because it's not theory, it's real life. And if we believe that they can come home, then we will put that into action, right? So we have to believe that our political prisoners will be home, so that we do, as Brother Omar, Omar said, and do the work to make that happen, right? right. So that's why that's why I'm here, brother. Thank you for having Greetings. me. Thank you for being here. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. My name is Sekou Abdullah Odinga. Uh, I'm a founding member of the New York State Black Panther Party, first section leader of the Bronx, Harlem section. Uh, founding member of the international section of the Black Panther Party, uh, soldier of the Black Liberation Army, former political prisoner, prisoner of war in the U.S., colony of New Africa, Founding member of the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition, part of the CC, uh, Spirit of Mandela Coalition in New York, or in the, in the country actually. Uh, a little about me. All right, let's show some love and appreciation for everybody who's here. I want to jump right in with a, a, a basic question that, that's for me. <laughs> I like the way you act like you were just whispering. That was funny. <laughs> Let me also say that I'm a close comrade of Dr. Matulu Shakur. I've known him since he was 13 years old. We come out of the same neighborhood in Queens, New York. I guess that's one of the reasons that I was invited to come up here also. And I was, I was just notified that we have one more person joining us, so um, if they're here, they can come up, they can grab my seat. That's the man, yes, indeed. Uh, Dr. Mack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I was told that he's the man, and I'd like you to introduce yourself, and we can begin. Okay, uh, Hotep brothers and sisters, my name is James McIntosh, um, and I'm, from, I'm rep here representing the organization CIMOTAP, Committee to Eliminate Media Offensive to African People. All right, so I'd like to welcome all of you who are from out of town to Philly. So I just want to do something real quick. I might be wrong. I might get slapped a little bit, but I'll start here. Um, you know, in our city in Philly, oftentimes events regarding political prisoners, movements regarding political prisoners, uh, sometimes it feels like we don't get a lot of black love um, at these things. Like, I, I'm really pleased at this event to see, you know, my brothers and sisters in the room here in support. I'm wondering from each of you as briefly as possible, but possible, but as concise as possible. This event is called uh, More Love for Matulu Shakur. How can we as black people begin to show more love to our political prisoners who stood on the front lines of liberation struggles during their lifetime, many as young people? And it seems like in some ways we're not reciprocating the love that people of a culture who, rep, who respect warriorhood would do. We're not showing love to our warriors. How can we as black, as the village, show more love to our political prisoners? And let's start with you, Dr. McIntosh, and work our way down. 
Okay, um, when we talk about different political prisoners and uh, say pretty much the same situation, uh, I think that what I've seen has helped in the past is sending letters. Um, and it can't, you know, the, you can't expect the masses of the public to know that that's something they should do. Through different organizations, you have one person or two people in there who understand what has to be done, and there are many different uh, opportunities to do what I just said, to send letters. So what we do at CMOTAP is at Kwanzaa time, we make postcards, mm. and we take uh, several political prisons. We don't do all of them all at one time, and we have each of the youngsters uh, fill those cards out. On the back of the card, it would say something like, seven reasons why this person should be free, and we teach them that. So we, people have to be taught, do, take those opportunities, and of course, money is always a, uh, a, a good, uh, good way of showing some love. Uh, at CMOTAP, I think we might have had probably one of the most successful um, you know, um, events for political prisoners, specifically for Matulu. We had a series of, of uh, debates called the Great Harlem Debate. It was a perfect time and a perfect moment. Uh, the first Great Harlem Debate actually filled up an auditorium that holds, uh, it's the largest auditorium in Harlem. It's the Salem United Methodist Church, larger than, than Abyssinian. And what it was, it was when Obama had been elected but had not yet taken office. So you can, people who understand need to be creative in figuring out how to educate. They need to be uh, assertive in getting their organization to send concrete support, like letters, postcards, mm. and money, and that sort of thing. So I don't mean to go on too long. Oh, I mean, good. That's the so, kind of thing so, so for the crew, this is what I'm going to I'm going to ask the questions, but I want you, as you're answering, to look out to the audience. It just makes for better visuals, <laughs> that, number that one. That light right there. That I light is see serious, that. though. I know. That's why I moved over here and I gave you that seat. <laughs> Number two, I'm asking you to hold the mic up to your mouth so that the audio is really solid, just right in front of your voice. And number three, if I, if I do this, that gives you about the one minute wind down warning. I try to be discreet, but I'm not always really discreet. Bobby, say go. Okay, I would uh, just pretty much echo what Dr. Mack just said, you know, that I think for, when we talk about how we can get people more involved, it starts with education. It starts with knowing. If you don't know, you don't know. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna do anything. But once we start educating people like this, this is a good example of how to educate. Have programs, invite people, invite the community. Hopefully there'll be people come that have not been before and they'll take the message home with them or to their church, to their organization, club, whatever it is, you know, it, we need to educate, encourage people to continue that education by teaching those that they're around. And remember their families, you know. Uh, one of the ways that we definitely can help our political prisoners is to help their families. You know, don't forget their family, their wives, their children, their parents. They have to try to get to get to see them. Usually they're far away from where they're from, you know. So I know people used to organize fundraisers to help bring my children to see me when I was in prison. I did 33 years in, in different gulags in the Sea Country. And my wife and my children, they didn't always have money to get to see me, so people would help raise money. So help, help the family. Remember that they are an extension of our political prisoners. And help organize legal funds, legal, uh, I'm sorry, I said enough. <laughs> <laughs> I was being discreet though, I was, finish your thought though. I don't I don't right there. Yeah, <laughs> but money. And I won't, I won't say how to, how you do it, but in so many ways, money can help if you, so, and in particular, I want to say this before I'm cut off. Matulu just come home. He came home with nothing. You know, you have to remember that when we come home, they don't give us no pension or nothing. They don't, they don't give us no, no weekly allowance or monthly allowance. We come home with nothing. He has nothing. He has a lot of medical bills. 
a lot of medical bills. I'm talking about thousands of dollars worth of medical bills. And that's, that's one way we, this is what this is supposed to be also is a fundraiser for Matula. Dig in your pockets. That's right. You know? And, and, and write checks. You know, checks are still good in America for that's a couple more days. Right. 